scriptures. We will read uh, verse 1 and 2, and we'll also read uh, 40. Exodus 28. And take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Ithamar, Ithamar <clears throat> Aaron's sons, and thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And then also verse uh, 40. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles and turbans, shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. <clears throat> so now you realize why God invented girdles, for glory and beauty. <clears throat> for the priests we're talking about. We're talking about for the priests. All right, um, this class is uh, primarily, we're going to get into the actual different portions of the high priest's garments, but I wanted to do a little wrap up on um, this thing about beauty that we talked about because we went over the fact that it's that these garments were are, are given, God gives us the definition for the garments and that is for glory and for beauty so that we don't need to read into it, well this represents this and this represents that, it represents glory and beauty and glory <clears throat> being primarily the presence of God and the presence of God in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, the only way to bring glory to God is through his son. Uh, and then we spend a larger portion of time <clears throat> dealing with uh, this aspect of beauty and God's definition of beauty. And um, I just want to read a few of my notes that I didn't get a chance to last time. I read, I, I, I read a little bit, or at least made a statement on it, but um, it seems foolish to men to spend your life in sacrifice. They might see the need for a ransom for mankind, but they do not see the self-giving heart of the son to the father as a burnt offering. <clears throat> Meaning, they might see the need for a sin offering. And as Christians, the primary thing that we are aware of is the sin offering when, in reality, for every, and as far as I remember, every sin offering was also accompanied with a burnt offering. And the burnt offering is a sweet savor offering. It has nothing to do with sin. It has everything to do with a representation of Jesus' nature, and particularly in this case, his relationship to the Father. <clears throat> In other words, his self-giving nature to the Father. That doesn't require sin. That doesn't require a problem. The burnt offering is a picture of the self-giving nature of Christ that just gives himself, period. So you can say before eternity, or, or before time began in eternity, before time began, there was no sin, right? As far as we know, there was no sin. All right. Was Jesus a self-giving lamb? Was that who he was and the way he was? And the answer to that is yes. And then we see in the book of Revelation, he's primarily not called Jesus in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> he's called the lamb. And... Um, so it's just important for us to understand that this beauty, that this beauty is something that we may not fully comprehend. We may not see these things as beautiful, but the Father sees them as beautiful. Welcome back, Scott. Just just for the tape's sake, welcome back, Scott, and happy birthday, Jennifer. Now we've got it all on tape, so. <clears throat> um, and, and I just think this is so important because in once time ends, sin offerings will not necessarily be a factor anymore. But this self-giving nature that is Christ will always, always, always continue on. 
All right, so let me read a little more. <clears throat> uh, I just said they might see the need for a ransom for mankind, but they do not see the self-giving heart of the Son to the Father as a burnt offering. They see when they see <clears throat> Jesus in this manner, not for sin, but when they see Jesus in this manner, listen to this carefully. When they see Jesus, when the average person sees Jesus as a burnt offering, because there is no sin involved, they see weakness and helplessness. That's what they see. Because the world honors strength. The world honors conquering and this sort of thing. And so he, he becomes despised and rejected of men simply because he carries himself in his own self-giving nature. When I say that, despised and rejected of what? Men, mankind, those who have <clears throat> different values, those who have different principles. But to the Father, that self-giving one, for example, in the incense, He's, he's being burned up. The incense is being burned up. There's a loss going on, but there's an increase going on too. There's a loss in the physical as that physical incense is losing its form. It is changing and it's ascending as a sweet savor unto the Father. Well, most people don't understand that. I mean, that... That's something that takes place in the, the holy place on the altar of incense, and we'll get into that a little bit as we go. And that has nothing to do with sin. That's something that God instituted in the inner recesses of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle being representing, first of all, first of all, the tabernacle representing the incarnated body of Christ and Christ dwelling inside that body okay uh, it says in John 1 that he tabernacled among us but that is only the shadow form of the true tabernacle the true temple which is us the body of Christ but but if you picture that tabernacle as a picture of the incarnated Christ <clears throat> as you come up to it and then just go through the door, the first thing you see is an altar, and the first thing you see is blood and death for sin and dying, and all you see this is about sin. You're going to have to go through another veil, and there is a veil called the door that leads you into the holy place, and then there's another veil into the holy of holies. Bef you're not going to comprehend anything past sin and problems and need in the Lord, if you come to him and all you do is you see the initial things that, frankly, the, the, the altar and all of that could be seen by the light of day. I mean, it wasn't within any covering at all. It wasn't until you began to go deeper into the Lord that you began to find, I'm going to say it like this, utensils, uh, vessels, certainly vessels, things within him that represent more important things to him and the Father than just sin. And then, as you literally get past the showbread, the table of showbread, and the, the altar of incense, and the seven-branch candlestick, if you go in through the veil, there you discover the Father is in the Son, just like if we're the temple of God, Jesus is in us in the Holy of Holies. Jesus dwells in our Holy of Holies. The Father dwelt in His. And that's why <clears throat> Jesus, uh, when He was talking about the Father, Philip said, man, show us. I, we we want to know this Father. We can tell by the way that you're talking, you have a special relationship with God. And it wasn't just God or the Father in a certain sense to Jesus. It was the one, because he said to Philip, he said, have I been such a long time with you and you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
You don't, you have not moved hardly past the first phase of the outer door that leads to the altar, and then the, the veil door that leads into the holy place, and then the veil which leads into the holy, you've barely come into this thing. And Jesus is saying, I want you to know what life I live by. It's not I. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he wanted us to know it for another reason, and that is Jesus walked as a man. He walked as an example of what man should be like. What does that mean? It means Jesus, just as a man, is indwelt by God and doesn't live by his own life but the life of God within him, and he's our example that we, too, are not supposed to live by our life but by the life of God within us. The same principle, different person. He had the Father living in him. We had the Son. But the principle is the same. True God-built man, the way God built it to be, true God-built man was made to be inhabited. He was made to be indwelt. He was made to have God in the form of the Son as his life. That's what Jesus coming in the flesh represented. Incarnate man, you know. I mean, we, uh, you know, I think of this all the time, but I mean, we look at Jesus walking this earth and he did miracles and we'd say, see, those miracles prove that he's God, that he's the son of God. These are proofs that he's the son of God. But Jesus would say when they said, you know, you did this on the Sabbath and you did that, he said, I didn't do that. The father did it. In other words, what I'm trying to say is there's a greater understanding and a greater revelation than just Jesus really was God and we can see it because only God can do miracles. There's a greater revelation. And that revelation is he, was a, he walked as a man and he lived as a man and he limited himself and he didn't use his godly powers because as a man he lived by the life and power of God within him so that when some miracle happened, he said, I didn't do this, the Father did it. See? And so, you know, what's great, we go, oh, I, I know Jesus is the Son of God because, look, he did miracles. Well, you know, it says in the book of Revelation that even the devil that shall do miracles, and many shall be deceived. Now, what's the difference? between Jesus as incarnate man doing miracles and Antichrist or whatever doing the same thing. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, one, even though they're miracles, it's his self. It's him. He's doing it. Do you catch this? This is, this is important. That's the enemy. Even if it's miracles. See, we get caught up in the thing instead of seeing the true principle of God, and therefore many are deceived. Okay? But the principle of God isn't miracles. The principle of God is you deny yourself and you live by the life of another. See, that's the principle of God. Well, see, the devil, Antichrist, in any form, anything that's of the enemy, is not going to live by that principle. Even if it does miracles, it does it to deceive you. It does it to draw you in. It does it to have my way. It does it to, to uh, get the preeminence somehow. It has ulterior motives. You say, but it's a miracle. Yeah, but what's the source? And again, I'll try to finish right here with that. But what's the source is this specifically. Here's the definition. The definition of what's the source isn't for you to pray and say, God, give me discernment. Who's doing these miracles? Is this the devil or is this God? The way to find the source is to know God's principles, the way God operates. And that is, Lord, is this person doing this themselves? Or have they denied themselves, and is this, is this you at work in them? 
Does anybody see the difference of what I just described? Because there's a, there's a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> many people are just seeking some sort of a spirit of discernment to be able to tell everything. And God's not wanting to give a random spirit of discernment for everything. Yes, there is discerning of spirits. Yes, it's valuable at times. But there are greater things than gifts that empower you, and that is the knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of the principle of God, the knowledge of the way he functions, the knowledge that, uh, if nothing else, the greatest knowledge of all, that he's a lamb first, and as a lamb, he will not do it himself. The words I speak, Jesus said, they're not my own. The works I do, they are not my own. That's the principle of God. And that's how you begin to discern God and understand God in these things. So, you know, the Holy Spirit wants us to know these things. Because if we don't, then we're going to, and, and I'm just telling you right now, you will eventually one day be in a situation where you're going to have to figure out, because it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, what does is, what is, uh, uh, Paul say about the enemy coming? As an angel of light. See, See, we, we say, well, I'll know it's the devil. As soon as I see that red tail and pitchfork, I'll know. And those, those horns, I'll be able to tell that when it's the devil. Because he's the only one that goes, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's what we're thinking. We're, oh, we'll be able to discern and figure out what's the devil by some sort of deal. No, Paul said that he functions as an angel of light. And it looks like the very light of God functioning through this messenger. The question isn't, God, give me a spirit of discernment, discerning of spirits. The question is, Father, let me see by what principle are they functioning. Are they living unto themselves? Are they doing this? Because, because if it's the enemy... If you're do, if when I say the enemy, I don't just mean the devil. I mean you, your flesh too. If you're doing it, several things. If you're doing it, if you're doing the works of God, quote unquote, like that, many wonderful works. Remember, Jesus said to those who said we've done many wonderful works, and He said, "I never knew you. I don't know you. I don't know that. You're not functioning by my principle." You say, "But they're miracles. They're wonderful works." God doesn't count. There's nothing intrinsically glorious in any outward thing that you could do for God. It either comes from the principle of the life of Christ or it's just you. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's not, it's not him. <clears throat> and so you will be put in a situation eventually, folks, every one of you. God will handpick the situation and somebody is going to look really good, and they're going to just say all the right things, and boy, it's just going to be impressive. Maybe there'll be miracles or something. And you could be sucked in, or you're going to say, Lord, if nothing else, in Bible school, I learned what was you by nature and your essence, as opposed to what is the enemy or what is us. Oh, what I was saying is that if you do the work, if you do the miracle, then when you don't get credit, you're going to be upset. When you do it, you'll go, well, nobody acknowledged me. I was, I, I was, you know, I did this and I did that. And, or when you do it and people go, hey, you'll go, yeah, yeah, and you'll take all the credit. But look at Jesus. When it was done through him, he said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. And here's the key phrase you can label over everything. Does it say, not I, but Christ? If it says, not I, but Christ, and doesn't take the glory unto itself, glory to God, then it's, it's probably coming out from the Lord. Now, here's, here's part of the problem. What is of the Lord isn't going to proclaim itself and say, now I'm really of God and you need to really believe me and trust me. And it's not going to justify itself. But what is of the enemy will always try to make itself look good and above everyone else. Got it? It will always. And it will speak highly of itself and proclaim itself. 
which is another one of those principles. <clears throat> so anyway, um, so what I was saying is that you, you step inside that tabernacle and you see Jesus died for sin, may we go deeper into the Lord and see that there are other things deeper within him. <clears throat> so anyway, they, when you just see this self-giving nature, then you see the world sees weakness and helplessness. He is despised and rejected of men for this. This torn one does not represent what is admired. Only victory and glory represents what is admired. For the Jews, they were repelled and disgusted at the blood and at the smell of death at the altar and its burning contents. You know, can you imagine, can you imagine, you know, like on the, on the Day of Atonement, the amount, I mean, you should, you should read it. I mean, there are a lot of sacrifices more than the ones we covered. We just covered the ones that the high priest did. There are a bunch of them going on constantly every day. All of the death, all of the blood. Anybody, you know, I know you have, anybody smelled blood, you know? And you just go, golly, you know? And just this whole thing of burning flesh, burning flesh, you know? And all of this going on and blood everywhere and, you know, gore and all that, you know, cutting open the parts and laying it out. And I remember when I was a Bible school student, I remember thinking about all that and I remember going, yuck. I mean, I remember thinking, Surely God could have come up with something better than all of this. I mean, I, I remember that. I remember thinking, this God, I mean, this is Almighty God. Surely he could have made a better way for priests to operate instead of all this slaughtering and killing and, uh, you know, and blood going everywhere and the smell of all that stuff. And I was just thinking, you know, the glorious great day of atonement was not glorious at all. It, there was a stench and a whatever. However, all of that represents the self-giving nature of Christ, and therefore it was a sweet savor to God. It wasn't just murder. It wasn't just killing. It wasn't just slaughter. It was a picture of the self-giving nature of Christ and how beautiful that is to the Father. All right. Um, so we've been, you know, discussing that factor about the beauty. There is no beauty that you should desire him. And uh, Nisi and I were sharing after class last week, and she shared something that uh, I just really, really did like. So I just thought I'd ask her to come up here and uh, share it with you all because it was a real blessing of the picture of the meaning and of, and of the definition, God's definition, and then man changing that definition to something that he, that is more compatible to what he likes. So, Nisi, would you come share that with us? Um, well, the Lord showed me this a while back and kind of piecing things together over time as he'd show me different aspects of things and then he kind of brought things together. Um, but in S Psalm 48, um, 1 and 2, it says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. And then in Psalm 50, um, verse 2, it says, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. And so it's saying that the, the perfection of beauty is, is there, uh, is to be beheld in Zion, um, and God is shining forth. And in Revelation um, 21, um, couple of verses just to keep it brief verse 11 um, this is describing what John saw as uh, the new Jerusalem here uh, when the angel showed him um, it says having the glory of God and her light 
was like unto a stone most precious, even unto a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And then also in verse 21 of 21. Uh, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every, and every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And so the beauty that can be seen by Mount Zion, as described in um, Psalms, is that he is able to be seen, and that he um, can be expressed and shine forth because of the transparency that she, you know, holds. And what the Lord had showed me through the whole book of Re Revelation, the Lamentations, was um, the real problem um, was that um, she began to take on an identity that was not as the Lord defined her to be. And she began defining beautiful her beauty as something other than what the Lord had said, this is what is beautiful. And so she was leaving what he called beautiful to something that she then called beautiful apart from him. And um, the book of Lamentations goes through, and there are several places. I, I just wrote down a few scriptures, but you can read the whole book and it's talking about her veils being stripped away and her skirts being stripped away and all these things being brought down because she had, and I believe that these veils and things um, are a, an example, like maybe something tangible to try and explain to us what she was grasping as her identity of beauty. And the Lord's saying, I'm stripping it away because this is not what I consider beautiful. And so we can read a few verses in Lamentations. Um, chapter 1, there's a couple that I'll point out. There's, there's a whole bunch. So you, you can kind of read the whole book to kind of get the feel of, of what God's problem and dilemma is with her identity that she is embracing, a false beauty. Uh, verse 6, it says, And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts that find no pasture. They are gone without strength before the pursuer. And then down a few verses in verse 9, Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembered not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She has no comforter. Um, and then let's see here. Chapter 2, um, verse 1 says, How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger, and hath cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. So he is rejecting this beauty that she has embraced, and it says that he even casts it down to the earth because it's something of the earth. It's not something of him, and it's not his definition of what he deems her to be beautiful by. And so he is rejecting that, and that's why, you know, Israel could not continue as well. She was embracing an identity that was not who she really was in his eyes and leaving the union then that she had with him. And so he can't be one with something that is of the earth. Um, okay, and so in verse 15, we see even the reaction of the people, the, the enemies here being able to see what's going on. It says, all that pass by, this, this is talking about the enemies, clap their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head. And I got this picture of like, nah, 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 nah. you know, I mean, they are like, dogging on her okay here it says they hiss and wag their head at the daughter of jerusalem saying is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty the joy of the whole earth they are, i mean they are just flat going you are not it and she is going i'm it i'm it and even the enemy can say you are not it you're not it and they can see that the why the lord is rejecting it they're like this isn't beautiful you know, this is not. So if even the enemy can say, you're supposed to be the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth, no. You know, if they are even at that point, 
No wonder God totally had to reject and cut that off, you know, if it got to that point. So even the enemies are like dogging her going, wake up, you know, you need to, to, to just wake up, okay? Um, so then another verse um, that I thought was very interesting in relation to how the Lord defined beauty both in Psalms and in Revelation, 4 verse 1, the very... Um, first half it says how is the gold become dim how is the most fine gold changed she's become dark she's not become transparent she embraced something that was not of him and so he could not shine forth out of something that is dark and that is dim any longer and so he could not accept that um, and receive that in union um, and so I just was seeing that the whole book of Lamentations is, is not just, you know, this, oh, God, what's, you know, going on? It's showing that she embraced a definition of beauty that was obviously not what the Lord called beautiful. Obviously, the enemies could even say, you don't have it. You're not it. You know, I, this is, you're missing it. And... Yeah. And that's why I believe in verse 1 of chapter 2, it says that the Lord cast down from heaven unto earth the beauty of Israel. He rejected it, and he said, this that you have and that you are embracing and that you are cleaving to is of the earth. And that's where it's going to be. It cannot be with me up here anymore. So um, that's what I shared with him. <laughs> well, we, the, the reason why Israel went into bondage and went into captivity, according to Lamentations, wasn't because of sin. It was because she redefined beauty as something that makes her look good or left the beauty of the self-giving nature of the Lord and there, therefore wasn't beautiful to him and didn't look like the bride he was after. Yeah. In Ezekiel? What verses were there? Ezekiel. Ezekiel 16, 13 through 15. 16, 13 through 15 for those who uh, get the tape or whatever. <clears throat> and, and it just reaffirmed what Nisi had just shared in Lamentations. Uh, this, is, this is a big deal to the Lord because um, all wrapped up in this beauty, yes, we, we can understand the bride, yes, can't we? We can understand the bride being, being what he considers beautiful, you know. I mean, you know, that's a, it's a strange thing. I, I could use a lot of examples, and I know we all have done this before. Uh, but, you know, the other day I saw Nicole doing a few extra things around here and just going the extra mile and doing it in the right spirit and everything, and I thought... You know how beautiful that is to the Lord. And, and like I said, I know we all do that and stuff, but I just happened to see that, and that's the example that came to my mind at that moment. But I thought, how, how incredibly beautiful is that to the Lord? Because, you know, it's, it's that spirit of Christ at work in us instead of us just being Christians, meaning having a Christian religion. And I'm sorry if I embarrassed you, Nicole, but, that's, but I saw the Lord in you, and it, it, was, it was nice. Um, and so, so our goal, folks, isn't just to be Christian and to have a set of doctrines that are Christian. Our goal is to be what, what pleases the Lord and what pleases Christ. And say, I can't separate this thing of bride from body because the bride is the body. And the body is the body of the high priest. And she is clothed. Well, um, 
Let's see, keep your place here in Exodus because I'm sure we'll be back. I'm looking for a marker to mark it with. But uh, in um, Isaiah chapter 52, <clears throat> which remember what sort of got us into all this was Isaiah 53, you remember? Where it says there is no beauty that we should desire him. Um, Isaiah 52 and verse 1. Awake, awake. Now this is the Lord saying, my God, you're asleep, wake up. Wake up to what? I mean, really, honestly, wake up to what? Wake up to truth. Wake up to depth. No. Wake up to the things that are important to my heart for which I have prepared you and prepared them for you. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. <clears throat> and just, you know, reading that, the rest of it is good too. But I mean, it's just, just this reality of him saying, you know, you are my body and I'm the high priest. Because remember, these garments don't go on us. They go on the body of the high priest. Now, here's why I'm saying that. If you're always thinking of yourself as an individual Christian, if you're always thinking of yourself of trying to attain in your own right, you're already off. You're going to miss the mark. You're going to shoot the arrow, and it'll be that far off right here, but by the time it gets to the target, it'll be way off, you know? What you need to do is come out of that individual thing of, I just need to put on beautiful garments. He didn't prepare beautiful garments for Christians. He pre prepared beautiful garments for two things mentioned in the Word of God, for the bride and for his, the body of the high priest. Only the body of the high priest can put on these beautiful garments. You can't. You're not allowed. Nobody else in Israel was allowed to touch those garments, to put on those garments, to defile those garments. Quit coming to the Lord in your own right and in your own stature, trying to build something on your own. Be what he has made you to be, his body. Quit thinking in terms of an individual Christian or an individual minister. Quit being you. Quit ye like men, Paul said in one place. Stop, stop having your identity in yourself. Become the body of the high priest. Then the Holy Spirit will work to have you clothed. And you can see that in, uh, where's that at? Uh, that's in Ezekiel too, isn't it? Where he, where he clothed the high priest. I think his name was Joshua. Ezekiel, is that? Oh, Okay in Zechariah and you ought to read that but you see all of that is happening it's interesting that that high priest name is is uh, Joshua I think which in the Hebrew that's the Hebrew name in the Greek name it's Jesus and he's taking and he's clothing his body you know we're going well that priest he was really messed up I mean he you know God really needed to intervene in his life no he needed to intervene in the life of his body it was the body that needed to be clothed that needed to put off the filthy garment you read it you, you check it out there well we read that and I don't know what we get out of that I mean we we are, it's it's like David and Goliath well what's the moral of this story folks there is no moral of this story you either see yourself in Christ or you have to make up stuff for you Christian concepts you know you either find yourself as his body or you find yourself as an individual Christian trying to trying to put on what God will never allow you to put it on no matter how dedicated you are as long as you are you but once you become Lord I come to you as your body the body of the high priest I come to you as your bride not as an individual but that we may all come, see, and uh, put on the, you know, the beautiful garments that he says there. And then you find what in Romans 13 that he says this, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. 
Well, what does that mean? Okay, it means as an individual Christian, I need to put on Jesus and not open myself by, you know, to certain things that would draw away my flesh. No, and we'll get into that in the, uh, actually in the next part of this class, if we even get to, get to that, um, is this relationship of, uh, of holiness to the Lord and what all that means. So um, let me just try to uh, make it clear to you because I, I fear sometimes that I'm just being a teacher to students. And I really don't want to do that. I want to speak from my heart, drawing out from what I believe, what I believe, I really believe this, drawing from the heart of the Lord concerning these things and the Lord who would use me at these times to answer your prayers. I, I mean that, and here's what I mean by that. Because if our concepts are wrong, not just our concept of beauty, but our concept of how to get those garments, if our concept is individual and not corporate, if it is individual and not as his body, then we come on a wrong basis. We come based on uh, someone that is separate, which he died and rose again so we wouldn't be separate. Somebody who's in trouble and messed up, which he died and rose again so we wouldn't be in trouble and messed up, if you understand what I mean. We'd draw from the vine uh, and be able to have his fruit. Somebody that is, in, in, does anybody do this at times? Come to the Lord as separate and as an individual and as the earth name that you got when you were born into this earth and the you that you, you got when you were born in Adam, if you understand. And we're trying to get hold of God. We're Jews. We're still under the old covenant. We're still, that, the old covenant is a, as a relationship of separateness that is seeking to get to God all the time. That's the whole Old Testament, always trying to get to God. The new covenant is... We got to God through oneness, and now all of these, consider this, all of these things are ours. All of them are now ours. All we have to do is possess them, but here's where we mess up. We try to possess them as Jews. We try to possess them as individuals. We try to possess them as not being what he calls us in resurrection, what he calls us by his resurrection. And so we love the Lord and we're so sincere and we're going to get to God and we're, I want, oh Lord, I, I don't want to have my own beauty. I want to put on beautiful garments and I want to put on Christ. Only the high priest really puts on those beautiful garments. Only the high priest puts on Christ. And you got to be one with him to be clothed with him. So does anybody see incredible importance of breaking with your old identity and your old definitions? Robert, did you have a statement you were? Amen. I'm not sure how well you could hear this over the, the uh, speaker, the people that are watching or listening to this, but Robert was just saying 
Uh, the high priest has those 12 stones on his, on his chest. And in other words, there's not just like one there or whatever. They're always together. They're always in oneness that God doesn't see you as an individual. He sees you as a, a, as a corporate Israel instead of an individual tribe. And that tribe is only a member of Israel, just like he doesn't see you as an individual person. He sees you as a member of the body of Christ, of Christ. He sees you as a member of Christ in the form of his body. Did you see the, why I re said that? Because we, we get used to hearing things the same way. And, you know, and then we just go, yeah, where's God? I already know that, you know. Uh, I, God help me to get past just saying that anytime. I never want to say that because I believe there's always depths of Christ that I don't know that I can get out of what was shared. And then, then Cassie followed up with just saying that that is an incredible encouragement and she just loves that picture of, of us on his heart and of course on his shoulders. And we'll get into that just a little bit. Uh, in other classes, I've covered a lot of certain things, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to, in this class, not recover because I, I might mention some things, but I don't want to just recover everything. <clears throat> All right, so um, just, I guess, in, in summation, and uh, this, this first class actually is not going to, it's going to be a, a glory and beauty continued in the class number two of this particular one or whatever, because all we have done in this one is, is refinish out that thing. And so um, there is this uh, thought that what if what happened to Israel in Lamentations and in uh, Ezekiel, and other scriptures mention this, what if what happened to them is happening to the church right now? What if the church has lost the, you know, I'm going to say it like this, God's dictionary, the Bible, or the way that he defines things. And the beauty now is the one who is the biggest, the strongest, the most famous, that can do the most miracles, that can, you know, draw the biggest crowds. And he takes all of that to himself. His name is on everything. His glory is on everything. He hardly ever mentions the Lord other than he's doing all of this for God up in heaven somewhere. What if the church is in danger of God looking and saying, saying Israel did the same thing, but they did it with shadows. You are doing it with the real. And there is no beauty of the lamb. There is no beauty of the burnt offering. Um, <clears throat> did you ever read, for example, uh, in some of the Old Testament prophets, you know, they're getting towards the end of everything that's messed up. And, and they, they'd say stuff like this, I, I hate your new moons, I hate your burnt offerings. Did you ever read that? And you go, I remember reading it once and going, what are you, why do you hate it? You're the one who told us to do this. You know, don't be hating. <laughs> and, and looking at it like, you know, um, we're doing what you ask us to do. Does anybody see from that that it's not the doing of the thing, but the comprehension of what we're doing behind it? And that is just killing something in a burnt offering order but not doing it with the understanding that this represents a self-giving nature is an abomination to the Lord. All right. So what, what does that say to us in this church right now? It says, you can go through the motions of doing the right stuff. We can... Um, you know, we can, we can uh, write books and then have... Uh, Orientation, and uh, is orientation the one where they go over all of the, okay, have orientation and go over a book of rules. And I remember when I was writing the rules and I was going, oh God, this is not good. I remember that because I was thinking, all they're going to get is the rules. 
if, the, if we don't have orientation, because you could just give out the book, couldn't you? If we don't have orientation, and at orientation have people that understand the spirit behind it so that when they explain it, they go, this isn't just about not doing this or that, you know. Uh, for example, um, shower times, and I'm sure it's no issue now, but it used to be, you know, the showers were in that one room, and guys would only shower between this time and that time, and girls between this time and that time. And I remember one student, he was a foreign student that was here for a short time, and he said, why do we have to do that, you know, have these times and all this stuff? He said, I, I want to take a shower now. And he said, well, it's the girls' time. He said, but there's nobody in there right now. I said, but what if a girl wanted to take a shower right now, and then you're in there, now they have to wait. And I said, they said, well, that's a stupid rule. And I said, no, it's a rule based on honoring others and giving others their time and their turn and putting others first and you, you know, flowing with that in the right spirit. And I said, you have no comprehension of the spirit of the rule. Therefore, the rule to you is just stupid because self and flesh says, I want this now for me at the expense of who cares if somebody else, when it's their turn, wants to come in? They can wait on me. Anybody see what I'm talking about? <clears throat> what I'm saying is this. Just most of the rules that we ever put down, honestly, were not meant to be rules, nor did I ever want to make rules, ever. I mean, remember, this is the guy that came out of the hippie movement. <laughs> but we did it. Really and honestly, we did it for one purpose, and that was so that in orientation, the spirit of the thing would go so that people would go, I get it. It's not about what you do. It's about the spirit and what you do. So my statement a few, second, a few minutes ago was, would it be possible for us to just do the stuff that's right and not have the spirit of it? And the answer is yes. And the result of that would be, what? The same thing that happened in Lamentations. If we all, if we all start just doing the stuff, going through the motions, and we don't have the Spirit of Christ in it, we've got no reason to exist. There's no beauty to the Lord. There's no preciousness to the Lord. There's no bride to the Lord, and there's no body to the Lord. It's just people who think that by being in the right group, believing the right doctrines, and doing the right thing makes it okay, and I'm telling you it doesn't. Yeah, Rob? And see, that's the deal. These, these garments are for beauty and glory, for glory and beauty. And the glory there is, didn't we do, uh, Matthew 5, didn't we do, this is what Robert was saying for those who didn't catch this, that, that uh, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? And it goes back to that principle I was saying, the Lord says, I don't even know you. You know why? Because I know my son. I know the self-giving nature of my son. And you're proclaiming yourself. You're doing it yourself. You're the wrong source. So I don't know that. I don't know that spirit. I don't know that. You say, but, but it's Christian. But it, he says, but it's not Christ. And then what Robert was pointing out is, and didn't, didn't we do many wonderful works? Here it is. In thy name. You see, we said, well, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, but at least I'm doing it in your name. Well, again, and I'm trying to close with this, we violate the whole principle of the incarnation of Christ and the nature of God by being man that does it on his own and that doesn't do it by God within. So, you know, this, this closing, and that is, Let's not be found just doing stuff. Let's not be found 
like the, the rich young ruler. I, I, I've kept all of these commandments from my youth up. And the Lord has to say, well, sorry, you know. I've done it all right. This is going to be hard, but I'm going to tell you, quit doing it right and get hold of Jesus and let Christ live in you and let the Spirit of Christ fill everything that you do and bring Christ into everything. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, I think it was this morning. It's been a long day, but, but uh, Robert and uh, Ben came, got there a little early at my house. They've been putting in some new windows, and I was sitting out on the balcony about seven o'clock or something like that and we sat out there and the sun hadn't hit us yet and trees covered nice breeze and very nice sitting out there on the porch and I'd been out there about an hour I guess already reading the word and reading a book and just read some different things to them and just felt the presence of the Lord and the life and the spirit of the Lord and just thought you know this is a good way to start the day this is a good way to just begin with the Lord you know and have and, and be covered in that fragrance, that sweet-smelling fragrance of Christ so that God's not just honored because we were good workers or because we were faithful or because we, you know, did things in a, with integrity. No, we did it filled with Jesus. Amen? All right, so we're going to end. So you understand the, that this was actually part two of uh, glory and beauty. All right, we're dismissed, and we'll come back in about five, ten minutes.